so for this session of Trainers Underground, we're going to have a special guest, John Hone. He's going to talk to us about the evolution of the internet uh, and standardization and why you should care. And with that, John, hey, how would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what you're going to talk about? Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is John Hone, uh, IT manager in Western South Dakota. And what I'm going to talk about here today is just talk a little bit about the evolution of the internet. Um, specifically, to give you some background about this session, I was asked to do a presentation at a security conference in September, and one of the items that I went through here and looked at was, from a security aspect, how FQDN spoofing is affecting cybersecurity and kind of the background behind it. So the session kind of goes through the evolution of the Internet, specifically around namespaces and how all the namespaces have come together, and then what those liabilities are in regards to cybersecurity. So just kind of some brief things here in regards to an overview uh, and, and kind of talking a little bit about this from a historical aspect, really looking at the beginnings of the Internet as we know it with some information here, and, and you'll see different things in regards to the exact dates, but in the early 70s, ARPANET uh, being really introduced as a United States DOD project to allow for communication to happen between different strategic areas within the United States. And in the timeline here, you can see in the early 80s, that project was expanded to the National Science Foundation and became more of a research platform for United States-based research to occur between different collegiate organizations. Continuing through kind of this, this real brief uh, historical view of the internet. 1982, the TCPIP actual protocol was standardized. Uh, so the, the real beginning of the use of standard protocols between different connecting environments. And in 1985 is when the very first general purpose top level domain names were actually ratified and introduced. So that's where we're going to see the .edu, the .com, the .net top level domain names in general circulation. Beyond that, uh, kind of some continuing milestones in regards to namespace and resolution. Uh, IANA established in 1988, uh, which ran really as a sole individual for almost a decade until 1998 when ICANN was established uh, and really started the proliferation of globalization of Internet and Internet protocols. Skipping all the way to today, uh, roughly 3.8 billion Internet users worldwide. So uh, from 1971 of having four to five internet users to 3.8 billion uh, in a fairly short span. When we look at kind of these foundations of the beginnings of namespaces and the internet globalization, ICANN and IANA are two organizations that really pioneered how namespaces, IP assignment and protocol utilization was really proliferated to become not just something that would be a U.S.-based tool, but really a global-based tool for everyone to use. ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, uh, which really is kind of the governing agency that oversees a lot of things that occur in regards to Internet and Internet usage. And IANA, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, really gets into the meat of IP address allegation, root zone management, and Internet protocols. So two organizations that are there, they're very key to how the Internet functions and what types of, of Internet components are going to be out there. And we'll be out on, on a couple of these different websites here during the talk. Continuing forward, when we talk about, again, this globalization of the Internet, when we look at things like IP address assignments, actual publicly routed IP addresses, we're going to see that essentially the globe's been established in five different geographical registrars where you're going to see each of those five falling underneath IANA and then subdivided based on different geographical locations. Right now in North America for the United States and Canada, we're going to see that Aaron really makes up our number authority and it gives us the ability to go out and see information about uh, IP address assignments, not only to be a subscriber of an IP address, but also to do lookups. So if we were to go out as an example here and look at Aaron, Aaron.net, 
Up here in the top right-hand corner, we could perform some sort of a lookup and type in that IP address, which is a public IPv4. And by putting in that IP address, what we'll actually see is the ability to establish who that name is registered to. And if we drill in deeper, we'll actually be able to view information about that registering entity, contact information, and, and really just allows us to have a mechanism to go back and kind of view information about IP addressing, IP address assignments. Again, our location, Aaron, which services North America, or a majority of North America, uh, as you'll see in the map that's here. Now, for anything to actually make, or, or for the Internet to actually function, for us to make these connections, DNS is really a pivotal piece of this. And when we talk about DNS, DNS is the ability for us to uh, perform a fully qualified domain name, or an FQDN, resolution to an IP address. Ultimately, when we make a connection from our client device to any type of another service, we're really doing an IP to IP address communication. With FQDNs and DNS, it allows us to utilize a friendly name, so we can use that friendly name using the DNS system, resolve that to an IP address, and ultimately allow our machines to connect. And what we would see on our end as the consumer is the FQDN. When we talk about DNS, DNS is a hierarchical system that is going to allow us to establish uh, a, a top, in this case the root, and from that root, levels in which each level stores data about the level that is just below it. So in this example here, you can see uh, the, the hierarchical structure where we've got the root, that root representing the uh, topmost or the dot in my FQDN resolution, top-level domain names or TLDs representing the layer just below, and then we'll actually see registered namespaces below that. In this example here, things like Google.com, Yahoo.com, uh, actually representing that next level, and then potentially even hosts or further subdomains, depending on how far we need to go. So in this example here, mail.google.com. This whole process takes place from the resolver to the local DNS server that services it and actually performs a series of queries back and forth, breaking that namespace up into multiple pieces. So over here on the right, we'll actually see the ability as the uh, resolver, that would be me as the client, the actual desktop client, actually making my request, for instance, something like www.google.com, passing that to my local DNS server. When we talk about passing things to our local DNS server on my client machine, when I look at an IP config, in my IP config, I'm actually going to see my local DNS servers that are servicing me as the client. So my resolution is being passed to my local DNS or whatever's configured to be my DNS for myself as the resolver. The DNS server on my behalf will start a process of querying that namespace starting at the least specific, in this case the root, and asking for the next level below. So again, in that example of www.google.com, it would start with the root and ask simply for the top-level domain name or the next level to the left, the com. The com then would be answered by the root DNS server, giving the DNS server that's servicing my resolver uh, the destination for the com servers, at which point the server would go to the com or the top-level domain name servers, ask for the next level, which would be Google. It would come back to my server with an IP address of Google's namespace, and then I would go to the second level where ultimately I would ask for, in this case, the www being the host, and I would receive an IP address. That entire process of name resolution must occur before an actual communication can happen. So again, doing something like pinging google.com before I can actually make that connection to start the pings in this case, a resolution had to occur to take that www.google.com and resolve it to an IP address so the communications could occur. Happens very quickly and could potentially traverse multiple servers across the world, uh, depending on what I'm trying to resolve. So what's the anatomy of an FQDN? 
In this example here, we have an FQDN, www.iana.org. And what I put at the end on the far right is the dot or the root. In an FQDN, there's an assumed root at the far right of the fully qualified domain name, and that's what really establishes the root and how the root resolution will begin. So in this case, kind of following what we had looked at with that resolution pattern, I'll see my resolution would start at the furthest side to the right, the root being the dot. My resolver and DNS would go to the root server, which would ask for org, the next level. Org would then respond back with an IP address to my resolver, where I would then go to org and ask for IANA. I would then go to IANA and ask for the host, in this case, a host would resolve to 192.0.32.8. So what is root? When we talk about root, the root servers really are the global beginning for how name resolution occurs and how all fully qualified domain names are ultimately resolved. When we look at the root servers, there's 13 root servers that are managed by 12 organizations. Uh, VeriSign actually maintains two of those servers that are out there. And if we were to look at some references, here's an IANA reference for the root servers. So we'll go back out here to my browser. And within my browser here, we'll just look at uh, root servers. which allow me to identify who the root servers are and where they're located. What you're going to see is the root servers are going to be alphabetically named. So we're going to see A through M. We're going to have IP addresses, both IPv4 and IPv6, and the managing institution that's actually maintaining that particular root server. So again, we can see root servers A through M. With these root servers, we're actually going to see information about those root servers in which they've been distributed globally and through IANA and ICANN, given the ability to reuse publicly passed IP addresses so that they can exist in more than one location. This website here is right off that first link that we hit. This is a visual diagram that shows us where all the root servers are. And if I scroll down, I can actually see those root servers and their physical locations based on their alphabetical designation. So if we look at the Bs, we can see that the B root servers exist in Los Angeles and Miami, both of those locations using 199.9.14.201. And if we continue through, based on each one of those alphabetic designators for the root servers, we can see all the physical locations in which those root servers exist. And the map is neat because if I scroll in and begin to zoom, we could dive into a geographical location like Denver, Colorado. And this would allow me to identify what root servers exist in that particular geography. So it does allow us to go out there and actually see those uh, geographical locations for the root servers. These root servers are going to be built into my DNS server, the actual server architecture. As an example here, if I pull up an MMC console for the DNS manager. These are Windows server, DNS servers. And I look at the properties. What I'm actually going to see is these will be pre-populated with root hints. Root hints are the, the name values for each of those root servers and the associated IP address for those particular root servers. And this is really kind of considered to be just public knowledge. This is information that gets publicly passed. In fact, I could add or remove to these or I could even copy the root server list from another DNS server if I felt that this particular list of root servers was corrupt. When we talk about TLDs, TLDs are the top level domain. So from the root, the next level of, of query that occurs in resolution is going to be the top level domain name. The top level domain names really establish that top most level in the hierarchy where then name resolution and ultimately namespaces and propagation will occur. Uh, in 1985, the first general purpose ratified TLDs included COM, EDU, GOV, MIL, ORG, and NET. Now, there was also a, another one that was in here called .ARPA, uh, but that was not something that was publicly utilized. With all of these, as we go through and we look at these top-level domain names, we're going to see that this list is consistently being updated. 
Uh, today, there's over, over 700 top-level domain names that are ratified, that are publicly passed by root servers, and there's over 2,000 top-level domain names that are being proposed and still waiting approval. IANA maintains a list of these top-level domain names in their TLD uh, root database. Again, I'll grab the link that's here, and we can go out here and we can look at the root database of all the top-level domain names that are being stored uh, and, it, and ultimately, again, being propagated from root server to root server so that the next level of resolution can occur. Now, there's some staples in here uh, that we're all used to seeing, for instance, the .com, the .org, the .net. Uh, but over time, what we've started to see are very specialized top-level domain names being introduced into the system. Uh, as an example, we'll pick on this one right here, so we can see Disney has a .abc. That is a publicly passed top-level domain name that exists on the root servers, and that has been registered and, and been made, made available for use to Disney as this example. Within this top-level uh, root zone database, we're also going to see two-character country codes. Any top-level domain name or TLD that's two-digit is reserved for the use by a country. They're actually called CCTLDs, Country Code Top Level Domains. So anything with a two-character or two-digit is going to represent a country code. So there's all kinds of things in here that have been used for different things. But as an example, if we go through here and scroll down, we'll find the T's. You'll see URLs, and you'll see lots of websites out there that use .tv, where to a traditionally English-speaking audience, uh, we would assume that means television, uh, which is actually incorrect. When we go out here and we look at something like .tv, we're going to see that that is a country code that's been issued. And again, it's been made available to that particular country for their use, however they choose to use it. So any of these things that we see that are two-character, again, always are going to represent uh, a country code of some sort. And all kinds of specialty use items that you're going to see within this based on organizations that have petitioned to have names put in. So you'll see organizations like .toyota, .ford, uh, General Motors, all kinds of, of different organizations that have gone through here and, and had names put in. Now, organizations petition and go through the process of getting top-level domain names really for one of two reasons or, or for two reasons, one being for marketing. This allows an organization like Toyota to actually own the TLD, and by owning the top-level domain name, they actually get to dictate not only how that gets used but how that gets marketed. And the second reason would be from a security aspect. Top-level domain name registration actually becomes the topmost level in which SSL certificates and other sub-namespaces have to go to become registered. So as the example here of Toyota, if someone wanted to have a, a, a subdomain of .toyota, they would have to actually have the explicit permission from Toyota Motor Company to actually be able to use that. Uh, that would also proliferate into the use of SSL certificates. So if someone wanted to spoof or, or try to capture uh, a fat finger equivalent of something .toyota, the only way they could truly get that SSL certificate is to go through that top-level domain namespace or the actual owner of the top-level domain name in this particular instance. So lots of TLDs that are out there and many more to come in regards to how those top-level domain names are out and, and how they're getting used. Again, today just over 700, uh, I expect thousands within the upcoming years. So let's look at a couple statistics here. And, and this is where we get into the, the globalization of the internet and, and really where this is playing into how the internet will evolve going forward. This is a stat that I pulled off of uh, internetworldstats.com and this I pulled about a month and a half ago where it's actually identifying per country or per region what the population of that region entails, what their population in regards to the global population would include from a percentage aspect. And then the, the th third column over that has read the Internet users as of the 30th of June in 2017 is actually showing 
how many users consume internet resources in that particular geographical location. Now I want to stress this is users by person, not device. So this is a unique user count for these particular areas. And the piece here that you'll notice, you know, North America, which really was the birthplace of the internet and many of the protocols that get used, uh, represents a very small percentage of internet usage. So we're gonna see North America comes in at just over 8%. If you look up, second one from the top, Asia represents almost 50% of internet users globally. And this pie chart shows it a little bit better. Again, that disbursement of unique users in the global population that are consuming internet, uh, Asia by far staggering amount of users. And this, is a, this in and of itself causes an issue. When we think of the history, and that's why we started with a little bit of a history lesson at the beginning, the internet was a project by the United States DOD. Uh, a majority, at least of the initial internet protocol generation, a lot of the RFCs that generated different rules as far as how protocol stacks functioned, uh, even things like DNS, all revolved around an English-speaking audience, English-speaking researchers. Today, when we look at consumers, we're going to see over half of those consumers are coming out of areas where uh, English is not or may not be the predominant language that they're using to consume Internet resources. With all of that is where we see things like uh, internationalized domain names enter the mix. So we've already talked about country codes. Again, those are two-character. Any two-character designation is always going to be a country code. We're also going to see, again, organization-specific, J.P. Morgan, Honda, Food Network, so on and so forth. But the last one down here is really kind of the evolution of what we're going to see for consumers of the Internet and those actual Internet resources trying to level the playing field so that the FQDNs that they use to access their resources mimic something that would be in their native language. So it's four different examples down here of top-level domain names and, again, those internationalized domain names. When we go back and we look at our top-level domain name list, so this is back on IANA's website, you'll notice as I start to scroll down towards the bottom, we'll actually see the introduction of a lot of these internationalized domain names that are, again, live. These are publicly passed today from the root servers to the TLDs, to those top-level domain name servers, passing non-ASCII characters or non-English speaking native characters as resolvable FQDNs from the root servers down. So internationalized domain names are here and that growth, when we talk about 2,000 uh, different TLDs being introduced in the upcoming years, a majority of those are going to be into this internationalized domain name category in contrast to uh, additions in more ASCII sense. Uh, or, or more English code sense in regards to how these characters are coming through. So with that, introduces an issue. And that issue here uh, is that DNS, by design, has the ability to pass ASCII characters in FQDN form. The DNS protocol stack and the actual usage of DNS, and even for that matter, from the root servers down, technically don't have the ability to pass these non-ASCII characters. The resolution for this was something called PuniCode. PuniCode is the ability for uh, uh, some sort of connecting device, as an example, uh, Firefox, Chrome, Edge, Internet Explorer, Safari, to be able to take something that's non-ASCII form, resolve that into PuniCode so that DNS resolution can occur and an IP address can be found through an FQDN resolution, and then ultimately get the consumer of that web content or that resource to their information. Now, you're going to see these PuniCode translations in DNS, and they're very obvious because when we look at a PuniCode resolution, we're actually going to see an XN dash dash always used as a prefix for any top level domain name or subdomain name through an FQDN resolution that had to go through a PuniCode process to be deciphered. So we'll actually see these actually hit DNS in that particular form. So let's look at an example here. I'm going to go out 
and we'll clear my cache on my DNS servers. I'm not sure which one I'll hit. And we'll grab an example. So here's an example of a internationalized domain name. And we'll just use another tab here in Firefox. I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. And when I paste that in, resolution will occur so that my browser can make a connection out to that particular resource. Now, what I'm looking for in the actual DNS cache is here. So I can actually see I hit this DNS server, resolution is occurring, in which it's resolving what's called puny code. And those puny code resolutions I can see in my DNS cache because they're actually going to allow me to establish, again, these equivalents in a puny code sense so that the DNS process can resolve and then feed my browser back an IP address so I can get to the resource. The reason I found these is I was actually going through my DNS and started to see these puny code equivalents show up and really started this whole process of trying to figure out what they are and, and what they're trying to get to. So this is now going to represent the top level equivalent and the subdomain ultimately with the A record resolution to the IP address so that I can gain access to that particular resource. And again, this whole process here is referred to as puny code, uh, the process to take something that's not ASCII and convert it into puny code. Now, there's a fun resource. It is called the puny coder, and it literally is just www.punycoder.com, puny coder where I can use a puny coder to feed it information to tell me the puny code equivalent. So all of my examples that I have up here, I can actually go through, take an example of puny code, or, or an internationalized domain name, excuse me, and feed it to the system so it will tell me the puny code equivalent that DNS will use to resolve that particular character set. So again, the ability for me to feed this really anything that would be non-ASCII and see the equivalent. And you'll notice if I put in just a standard ASCII, it's going to convert that to the ASCII equivalent that DNS will use to do the conversion. Because there's no conversion required, there's no puny code, so I'm going to see a native domain come across uh, in the full ASCII. So with this, what we're going to see is a, a new breed of attack in which the internationalized domain name is being used in homograph attacks to actually try to target end users to click on URLs or links and make the link look incredibly convincing. And in fact, with a lot of these examples that I'm going to show you, they actually have SSL certificates that are valid. Uh, they are HTTPS. And when an end user would look at that particular URL, let's say in their, their web client for mail or their mail client, and they hover over the URL, it would not show them an erroneous looking equivalent. It would actually look like uh, the, the DNS name that they think they're going to. So I have a couple examples that will show up here. When we look at some of these examples, these are all real. Every FQDN that I'm going to show is publicly passed, and they're all uh, publicly available. You see on the left, we have Google.com. On the right, we have Google.com. Now, one characteristic when we talk about DNS, all DNS names are lowercase. So in the ASCII character set, all FQDNs will always be lowercase. With that said, when we look at the URL for the FQDN on the left side, that FQDN on the left side is using a character that resembles an ASCII character G, uh, but it's actually using a different character set to create the G in what appears to be Google.com versus Google.com on the right, which is the actual true uh, FQDN or the full name that is truly registered to Google. Again, to an end user, these would be hard to decipher. Uh, to somebody that's more technically minded, if I look at the one on the left, I'm going to see that that appears to be a capital G and it would be an error. Another example that's here, and, and this one's a little harder to view, we're going to see that we have wikipedia.org and wikipedia.org. 
the two examples both are resolvable. Both of these are true domains that are out there and, and have web content behind them. But we're actually see the one on the right is the true wikipedia.org and the one on the left, the last A in Wikipedia is actually from a different character set that allows it to create a character that would appear to be a lowercase a, but truly is not. Either one of those would work. Both of those go to web content. The one on the right is going to give the end user the correct content. Uh, the one on the left is going to give them content that's an error. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, when we talk about internationalized domain name protection, uh, and I kind of say protection with tongue in cheek because an internationalized domain name is nothing to be protected against. It's rather something that is actually probably more widely used outside of the United States uh, by consumers of that internet market that make up a very large percentage of the consumers. But from a malware aspect and from a cybersecurity aspect, things like user education are helpful. The problem with that is that these are becoming incredibly difficult to decipher and hard for people to actually see the difference and they will become more and more prevalent as these uh, mature and people figure out ways to actually use these to spoof addresses. Spam filtering, uh, to try to catch things coming in through email, um, antivirus, anti-malware, operating release privilege on the workstation, all of these are things that are going to help. But the next one that I have listed here, keeping your operating system and your browser current, is probably one of the things that's going to give you the biggest benefit in regards to protection. Now, as an example, we're going to see, and this is right off of the, the Chrome 51 release, it's actually specifying Chrome will look for uh, things like Latin uh, characters, Greek characters, things that can't or shouldn't normally be mixed in any type of an FQDN. So keeping my browser current is going to be one of my best ways to help to defend myself against uh, an IDN type of spoof attack. With this, I want to remember it's not only my Windows devices, but it's really any Internet connected device that would have IDN support. So that would be mobile devices, so my iOS devices, Androids, Windows mobile devices, and then beyond that, any smart device that I have, maybe even just uh, an appliance, that has the ability to do uh, IDN resolution through whatever browsing system it uses, it's inc incredibly important we keep those current so that they are not subjected to uh, an IDN attack through puny code resolution. That will conclude my presentation on internationalized domain names. Uh, thank you everyone for watching and hope to see you again. Well, thanks a lot, John. I really appreciate it. I, I learned stuff I didn't even know. <laughs> I didn't know anything about those puny, puny codes or whatever that is. So that's really interesting. And I could see where someone could use that as an exploit. Yep. Very powerful stuff. Um, is, hey, Rob, are you out there? Do you have any questions? Just figured I'd ask, just in case. Yes, I'm here. I have a question for you. So you mentioned uh, about protection against IDNs. Is there, do you foresee a automated process that will actually check for any of these uh, IDN requests that could potentially lead clients to susceptible sites? Uh, it's a, Rob, it's a tricky slope. Um, I've actually talked to people where, you know, they said, well, let's just block Unicode resolution on a DNS server uh, or do like, IP geofiltering at a firewall level. The problem is, is that when we talk about trying to automate protection against this, an internationalized domain name does not equate into, uh, let's say, a geo IP address coming from Asia because the NS resolution and the actual destination IP address don't have to match. I could have uh, Chinese characters in an internationalized domain name actually resolving to and accessing a web server that's in California. Because, again, the registration of the DNS and how the namespace gets used has nothing to do with the actual GOIP location. So it makes that very challenging because in, in, in some ways I could actually cripple 
my DNS resolution and my client accessibility to things by targeting just Unicode and IDNs. Okay. Now, do you think there will be something along the lines like what we currently have right now with um, some of the traditional pop-up blockers where you see known particular sites that are already resolved to known um, bad IPs. Do you think there will be something like that for the IDN as well, even well, though the resolution goes back to a, a valid IP address on a server somewhere? So I've got an extension. And I, I don't know if there's still a few in my browser, but uh, Chrome now has what's called a puny code identifier. It's a Chrome extension you can load. And it actually will pop up in red any time a puny code is sensed in my URLs where where I can actually load that. So I run a puny code alerter as a Chrome extension in my browser, which right now that's the only thing I have seen that specifically looks for IDN resolution to puny code. And it's just a like I said, it's an extension that's available in currently only in Chrome. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. That was that was very helpful, very beneficial. Like yeah. you said, I learned I learned some stuff that I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was really good. Well, you know, I never I learned, learned, I learned I learned all this stuff the hard way, which is really the only way you learn anything. Because <laughs> we actually had in our corporate environment, we had a Punicode attack come through on an Apple URL. And I've got it up here. Uh, and this is the one that just it, it scared me badly because it's HTTPS, and when I have it in Notepad, it looks obviously erroneous. But if you view it in Firefox, to date, Firefox has the hardest time with these. When I look at this in Firefox, there's really no way I can tell that that's not apple.com. And what's crazy, it's HTTPS, and it's got a valid SSL cert on it, which I think is crazy. Wow. That they've gone through and registered, and again, when you look at it, you know, just, just viewing it, it looks, it has the potential to be legitimate. It passes kind of that initial sniff test that most technical end users are going to hit. You know, they're, they're looking for the padlock, they're looking for, does the name match? Uh, and this one does. So it's really wild that you're going to start to see these come through, and they, that, is a, that is not a valid URL. When I go back to my puny coder, and if I just throw that in, I can actually see that they're using characters that got they got puny code resolved, but they're in the .com TLD. So it's crazy. Wow. wow. Very wow. Something new every day, I guess, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, Most definitely. That's definitely a very interesting thing. Uh, that's that's good information to know, and I guess our users and students and all that stuff probably want to look at this stuff and, and get that. Uh, what was it for Firefox? The uh, plugin? Chrome. Oh, for Chrome. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So there's a Chrome. There's a Punicode uh, detector plugin, a Punicode alert plugin for Chrome that that you can run. All it does is it tells you there's Punicode in the FQDN. It doesn't stop anything. Gotcha. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm really on the fence with this one uh, because of the enormous amount of Internet users that English isn't even a language, let alone a second language for them. So, you know, there are people out there that are actively using these FQDNs, and rightfully so. I mean, they're, they're just entitled to it as everybody else. It's everyone that's using these for, for evil, I guess, that are giving this thing a bad name. No doubt, yes. Well, cool. I think that was really helpful information. you have anything else to add, Rob? No, I thought it was really good. Well done, John. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. I really appreciate it.